Hello, I'm James Riley. Welcome to the Bridging the Cyber Divide webinar series um, brought to you in partnership between Innovation Oz and the Permissions Access Management Specialist, the cyber firm CyberArk. Um, this is episode one, Securing the Digital Economy, and today we'll be talking to Robert Deakin, the Director of Cybersecurity at the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, and with Thomas Finkenscher, uh, Regional Director of CyberArk. Uh, welcome, Robert, and welcome, Thomas. Um, yeah, Robert, I'm going to start with you. We're going to start with a very broad question. It probably sounds ridiculously broad, but when, when we're talking about the digital economy, and we know that this government has focused a lot of attention on uh, building a digital economy, what are we actually talking about? I think there was a tendency some years ago uh, to equate digital economy somehow with e-commerce, but it's it's way more than that, isn't it? So, what what are you what what are we talking about here? Yeah, I think um, the, the there's an exponential change in what his uh, the digital economy actually uh, means, or data actually means, or the information age actually means. In the past, I think the, you know e-commerce was more like the bridges specific pieces of, of transport infrastructure. And then I think over the last, maybe since the release of smartphones, people have started to realise there's a whole uh, ecosystem around the transport network, if I keep using this analogy. But really, the, this next phase we're entering is is not about uh, where you're going, what car you're in, what plane you're in, but why are you going? What what What's it all about? What do we use data for? How do we perceive the world, how to react to it, how do we apply resources to it? So the, the digital economy is much, much moving much further up the, uh, the that data pyramid from you know data, information, knowledge to wisdom uh, at the peak, and people are beginning to realise that data in itself doesn't have any particular virtue, and neither does wisdom. So um, it's it's that whole construct, and I think there's intellectuals who talk about it in a very very broad metaphysical sense, and then there's engineers who talk about it in bits and bytes and row hammer bugs and very specific <laughs> things. So it's everything and nothing. It's like love, hate, war, and peace. Um, and I think we're on a journey to really discover uh, what it is, depending on your perspective. Okay, and look, I I guess you know even the term digital economy and everything we meet around it has huge implications obviously obviously to people's daily lives um there are technical implications around how we how we design uh the frameworks that will drive it and there's regulatory in, uh implications about you know how we develop that society that that we want so so to thomas um given uh, as we said earlier, huge emphasis on digital economy by this government. There were a, a year ago, I think this month or last month, um, uh, the federal government issued its digital economy strategy, and there are a bunch of um, budget measures in October in that in that strange uh, post-COVID budget. So, uh, when we look at that big picture, are we are we ready here? What from a regulatory standpoint, from a technical standpoint, from a skill standpoint? How's Australia tracking to uh, you know to implement this in the way that we want? Yeah, good question. And uh, I think every day when you open the news feeds and newspapers, you hear another announcement around um, you know digital economy and 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 the importance of it. And especially when you come coming out of COVID, um, this is obviously the new mantra right now. But there is also a question around um, intent, which is absolutely there, the intent to basically have a leading role globally in this space versus the capabilities. And I think there recently there has been, um, I think it's the Harvard School, it's uh, the Belfer Center for, for Science um, and, and International Affairs. They actually had this sort of study around national cyber power in next 2020 in Australia an interesting position because they looked at 30 countries and Australia was fairly high up on the intent, which I think eighth place, but the capability was 16th place. So there is a divide between, you know, what we're trying to do, what we want to do, but what we can do. And I think when you, mm. when you look at capability, the problem is around, is there enough people with the skill sets in country? So in other words, do we have a domestic cybersecurity industry, for example, that can actually surround um, the whole digital transformation necessities? Um, that's a skill set topic. Do we actually have the ability to commercialize ideas here and and you know send them to um, other foreign markets and make and create a business out of that? 
So there are questions around that, and I think there's there, there are big issues that need to be tackled here. Um, so again, intent is good, very positive, but capabilities are questionable at this stage. Okay, and I guess uh, certainly from a government perspective in terms of the amount of effort uh, to build uh, digital government services and to, to drive that side of things, I guess the intent certainly is there. What do you make of that, Rob Deacon? Uh, look, Australia is in um, a brilliant uh, position uh, if we can harness the will and the capability can can follow. And that's you know a historical precedent. Once you get the will of the will, uh, it can happen. So if you look at uh, other uh, nations like Israel or Estonia uh, who've had sort of existential pressure on them uh, and they have adapted uh, and they've built uh, digital uh, economies and Israel for example, has a strong export uh, economy in cyber security. Um, but there is certainly short, medium and l very long-term uh, trends and, and factors. Um, you know, we're a $1.6 trillion economy. Um, I think the government's about a quarter, I think their budget base is about a, uh, $470 uh, billion. We spend $34, $35 billion on defence. Um, but we're, we're spending considerably less on on cyber. So even the, the two or three hundred million that we give to, you know, entities within home affairs or other is is really small when you compare with the economy um, and where value is generated. If you look at where the government gets its value from, you know, the taxpayers pay about two hundred to twenty billion dollars into the government. Is that money coming back to protect them as consumers in the cyber world? Uh, businesses get 87 or, or so say over 90 billion coming in. Are they getting money back to protect them? That's the other three quarters of the economy. And is the government providing the resources back into that and to position us in the future? And we are in a very good position because we have strong institutions, which is a, which is a key factor in the way the world is happening now. Uh, it's, if you look back historically to the Middle Ages or other periods where people have had trust, whether it was the Quakers or, or the various traders in the Mediterranean, they were able to make enormous fortunes because disparate communities could trust them. And Australia is in a position to be trusted. And the, other, the, third, fa the third factor, so I suppose the first factor is a middle, middle power. We actually have potentially the balance sheet that we could do it. Um, the second one is really you know, that, that uh, opportunity. Um, the third one is Australians surprisingly trust their government, right? So about 76% of people trust the government. We might not like this government or that government, but in general we think the government will, will. So we actually have the ability to harness ourselves as a nation to do things, things that authoritarian states can do because they have a level of trust, but not a different type of trust. <laughs> um, but other nations like Britain and the UK have demonstrated are struggling to harness their national power okay. towards to, towards that future. All right. Well, let's let's explore that just a little bit. Um, just before I go to you, Thomas Robert, can we, from a regulatory perspective, we sort of arrive at a time in history where tech giants are more powerful than they, you know, than than, than ever. Um, even in mm. the heyday of uh, of IBM, I don't think they wielded the kind of um, you know broad um, economic power that they do today. From a regulatory perspective, when we look across things, you know, as disparate as privacy to the use of data to consumer data rights, have we got the rails in place or is this a work in progress? It, it, everybody everywhere is making it up as they go along, you know, from, from Beijing to Mogadishu, you know. So we, we, we like others, uh, are having a, having a crack at it. But, I've, you know, Australians have a crack at it. We don't need permission from people to do things. Um, but we're also very pragmatic. Um, so all that is needed is to make sure that that constant pressure to improve the integrity of our organisations is is a civil discourse around it. Um, and I think we, we're sort of almost, we could almost get there. We're almost having civil discourse. Um, I think it's, it's much worse than a lot of people would like and they don't want backroom boffins discussing it, but getting shifting some of the the agendas that are talked about to to 
towards the middle, and this podcast goes towards uh, doing that, getting people talking about some of these fundamentals, not about fashionable things of the day, um, but, but you know, fundamentals of how the geoeconomics works, the pressures that are on us and why strong institutions are important. And therefore, you know, we're having a good crack at it. We're putting things in place. We're leading with CDR, for example, um, uh, and lots of other uh, initiatives the government's taking. But it's, it's, you know, it's a constant give and take between the, the different agendas. Okay. So, uh, Thomas, uh, if I can share, I'm going to ask you, Pretty much, you know, the similar questions, are we ready for this? But I wanted to, given that you're operating in this space and have been, you know, for a good part of a good part of your career, given the pace of um, the rollout of connected devices or just, you know, connected parts of the economy, um, every, it would seem every different layer adds another layer of complexity. Is that... Uh, a reasonable assumption are we are we kind of is are things becoming so complex that we will find it difficult to to pull back uh, I, I certainly believe they're becoming increasingly complex and and um, it's a multi-dimensional problem that you're actually running into um, we talked about um, you, the more technology you use the more you need the skill sets behind it to basically master the technology and technology itself is not sometimes easy to use in, in many ways I mean we're trying to improve user interfaces and making it simpler but behind those nice shiny interfaces there's a lot of complexity that you have to, to deal with but I mean the, the next problem is there are so many interfaces now coming um, into play and we all use multiple apps we, we, we're trying to have you know variable devices we, we have sensors everywhere that actually somehow collect data and then the next thing which has to do with digital um, 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 transformation is integration right so we're trying to connect things we're trying to connect systems everywhere and those systems are not always managed by the same people and not adhering to the same standards so that's a level of complexity uh, around that is the data management piece. Who is collecting data? When and where? Are you supposed to use them? Are you allowed to use them for certain purposes? So there's a, there's another problem in that particular space. So privacy rights, privacy rights, and privacy protection. Um, policies that you have to set. Um, regulatory compliance for certain industries that you have to look into. So there's, as I said, it's multidimensional. And from that perspective, it doesn't get easier. Um, I, I think there's there's many industries who are, who are trying to push ahead and they're trying to actually transform. But you know, once they go into into that space, they realize, oh, okay, we, we haven't thought about this, we haven't thought about that, so we can't go at the speed that we thought we could. Um, so yeah, it's complex. So can I let's just drill down into that a bit? I, I know that um, you've got. Uh, some interesting ideas within the construction sector of um, use of digital twins and doing interesting things in, in terms of that transformation. But just, uh, Thomas, can you just give me some examples of, of where um, uh, industries in Australia have done some interesting things, um, where we potentially have some kind of, if not competitive advantage, certainly some kind of um, a, a will to get things done um, and, and where we're lagging. Mm, yeah. So you mentioned the construction industry. Um, it's a it's an interesting one. People believe still it's like, you know, hands on brick and mortar, um, you know, very physical. But I think that has changed a lot. If you look at um, progressive uh, organizations in Australia and, and overseas, what they're doing, they're actually building a lot with data. They're building what they call digital twins before they physically build a building. And I always use the term you walk when you look into what some of those new uh, high-rise buildings or office buildings you actually walk into a vertical computer because in there everything is full of sensors recognition systems um you might walk into a meeting room and the meeting room recognizes who you are so it recognizes your identity because there is a camera or a scanner somewhere and then with that comes access to a screen and that you know displays certain information and it's all great right so it's because it's it's all user interfaces and it's it's easier for us to do our job but at the same time do I want that? Do I actually, has someone asked me whether they can take a picture of my face? Has someone asked me whether actually, you know, I, I want to have certain services provided to me automatically? Um, so that's, that's the challenge. I think it's, I think there's a lot of, a lot of interesting technology developments, but as I said to you, um, we also need to think a little bit harder around what that means from a individual consent model, privacy model perspective, 
And um, it's happening in, in, in pretty much all industries. Um, construction is one of them. The financial services industry has to has try to provide um, improved user experiences, easy access to services for many, many years. But uh, as I said, you know, the, the trust and the, um, the, the privacy and the consent model is a very important one. So, Robert Deakin, uh, I guess we're still talking on the regulatory side of things, but I'm very interested in the use of, well, in particular, di digital ID. I mean, there was a time in this country when uh, the notion of a digital ID was seen as such an invasive um, uh, invasion of privacy or potential invasion of privacy that uh, it mobilised forces against it. But really, ID is kind of a fundamental to how we will work in the digital economy. And there's so many different types of identity. Um, the, 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 I mean, you have an identity when you go to the coffee shop. The person might not know your name or whatever, but you have a presence and some credibility and um, attributes that the, the barista um, – sorry, being a Melbourne person, of course, I have to use that example <laughs> – um, knows you all right, versus a machine identity versus something that you've seen before, you don't know what it is, and then obviously your, your personal identity and there are attributes that can't change. It um, – it is it is uh, complex, but uh, you know I, I need to sort of I suppose challenge the 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 framing of these things as being complex and hard because they are um, you know having been a grumpy old engineer for thirty years and you know having had multiple breakdowns trying to deal with the cosmic horror of cyber <laughs> security you know I've, I've now really moved to a point of epiphany realizing that most of the muggles just don't care right. And the issue isn't the complexity. So if you go and use the products that you know, Thomas has or many of the other leaders have, it's the problem is solved, right? Um, it, the, the problem is the complacency and the adjustment of people to the change. So no one's, you know, attacking us specifically at the moment with kinetic weapons, but pensioners on the on the Gold Coast are being romance ransomed weird. So have we got the balance right in terms of where we're putting our our effort? And so have we got the balance right in relation to identity? Um, uh, my, you know, my, my experience has been that um, people have already traded away their privacy and uh, identity for convenience. Um, we have a hope in Australia that we could provide the convenience with the appropriate checks and balances, which I don't think we'll ever they would ever get in some other countries. In in some of some nations, that uh, identity and privacy has been taken away by techno authoritarian states with no choice. Um, so you know, I think there's two points here: the complexity can be solved, the identity issues can be solved, the security can be solved, but it costs, and the issue is the cost not the complexity and okay. embracing that and then seeing, and therefore that what are the benefits for people um, and, and it, people who are aware of the sorts of progress that some of the techno authoritarian states have made with privacy invasion um, and the incredible things that are there, if they were used with, with more virtue, um, uh, could, could be of great benefit, but they need governance and strong institutions to, so people can trust them. So I guess I, I guess uh, we can always make things secure. I mean, you would probably agree as an engineer, you can lock things down, but become so impossible to use and create so much friction. It's it's kind of less than ideal. So it really is. Well, when people tell me they've got zero, yeah. Well, when people say they've got zero um, risk tolerance, I say good. I've got an infinite budget, right? It's always uh, a balance. But there, the questions is that is is not the tech the technology is somewhat of a distraction. The, the brilliant engineers around the joint can solve this, but there are things that, are, that, that we need to trade off um, so, uh, uh, you, to solve those. Uh, so, Thomas, you must be uh, must make it feel good that you've got a ringing endorsement. <laughs> not, uh, you know, of well, they're, they're, an, they're a well-established <laughs> player, right? So but they, they've already not, got their street cred. That's right. Um, you know, if, <laughs> if not CyberArk specifically, then you know, technology more, more generally. Well, what do you make about this issue of balance um, between, you know, reducing friction uh, and making things more secure, but also reducing friction and still protecting, you know, things that we that we value, like uh, personal privacy and personal information? Mm. 
I think I think Robin made made a valuable point. You know, we said problem is solved. I mean, problem as technology wise, yes, we have a lot of technology available, and and it, it's an, it's probably a, a lot of technology, enough technology to, to to solve immediate issues. I agree with that. But at the same time, there's also a question of risk appetite. Um, risk appetite at a corporate level um, that organizations have. You know, how much risk am I prepared to actually go into? And yes, there's a balance between the amount of money you're going to spend on, you know, securing everything versus, okay, I might might have a very low probability to actually run into a cyber breach that is material for my business. Um, so there's a, there's a trade-off there. I agree with that. But at the same time, I think there is also some a lot of organizations that uh, actually haven't even done the basics. So you can we can talk, talk about risk appetite, but they probably don't even know what they're exposed to today. And I've seen that a lot. And, and I think that is that's a problem for because we talked about digital economy at the beginning, right? If you if you look at critical infrastructure in Australia, you look at things like water supply, electricity supply, you look at um, you know, um, traffic systems, public transport. Ports. I mean, there's lots of critical infrastructure, and if that that gets disrupted, seriously disrupted, that is a problem. And I think the risk appetite for things like that should be very low, because as they're called critical infrastructure for a reason. So yeah, we have to get. I mean, I understand the balance and I understand the availability of technology, but I also believe that in some organizations, it's under it's it's underestimated how how big the problem is. Can can I ask? Yeah, and I think I think we're saying. Go on. No, go on, Rob. So I think again, um, I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing, but I'm coming at it from a different perspective. So it's the, the, the human factors of risk management and risk taking. So in hardcore engineering, where you're doing failure mode analysis and it's, there's very structured engineering stuff when you're building a, a an electricity plant or a, 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 you know pumps and, and water or gas system or something like that. Engineering and risk management in that area is so different from the way risk management is handled in cyber. And it is still stuck in this uh, archaic risk likelihood treatment new risk, which does not work for engineering applications. It might work for decisions around HR or uh, even some, um, you know, broader oh s stuff but if you're talking to an explosives engineer at a mine around how they do engineering and the systems are, and so we are lagging fundamentally in the security domain around risk management and things even words like risk appetite there's still engineering stuff they not the things that have been talked about in the corporate box at the you know at the cricket games secondly on top of and, and the lack of the lack of engineering risk management is coupled with the human factor of executives with 20, 30 years experience in their particular industry and they don't recognise the step change, right? They're like Montezuma, totally unaware that, that Cortez is coming. Okay. Well, uh, and, so, and so us as talk, when we do all this boffin talking, they, they just hear blah, 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 acronym, or, you know, it's never happened in the past. And so it, some of them are waking up. But we need to move from a situation now where we've just got a win-lose uh, dynamic. We just lose, right, uh, to at least lose-lose, uh, which uh, I think, you know, sort of focus to, to lose-win. Um, okay. you know, fundamental shift in strategy. So let me ask, we haven't spoken about COVID. We haven't spoken about the pandemic. I think it kind of seems universally agreed that uh, COVID has acted as an accelerant um, on digital transformation or certainly the appetite. Um, for, for transforming things. Um, is, there a, you know, is there a bill yet to be paid in some of the work that's been done in the last six or nine months um, in accelerated rollout plans of digital systems? Digital system? I, I think it's the, op the opposite, right? So we, COVID gave us a glimpse of Cortez coming over the horizon it, 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 and it actually broke complacency in a number of points at the macro level. So telehealth, if, you know, a few things like that. It, it, it showed the government and the community, oh, hang on, the government can tell you to stay in your house and people will. Like there's fundamental shifts like that. So maybe we could do some other things for the greater collective good rather than the individual pursuit because the individuals who are making value out of it aren't sharing that wealth. I mean, that's the inequality gap that, that everyone's railing about around the world. Um, so it's 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 highlighted a lot of... Uh, 
gaps in systems and in, in trust um, in different ways in different communities. Uh, and, you know, cyber's had some great up, uplifts um, and uh, some other shockers. With You know, I think you had... Um, you had Chris on um, talking about all the problems with, with COVID attacks uh, previously. What do you think, Thomas? Just someone who gets around the industry, you're talking to a bunch of customers on any given day. What, uh, where are we up to? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's been a bit of a wake-up call because we've been forced to to uh, do things differently, right? Um, again, we're coming back to digital transformation, people using digital services, but now they're using them from different uh, from different environments. So in the past, you might say, oh, okay, as long as you're in a certain environment, my office building and my secure network, you can access certain services and it's all fine. But now we very overnight, we're shifting people into their home offices. And uh, I keep saying no one is really an expert in in. Um, securing their their home routers and uh, really managing the settings in a perfect way. So all of a sudden you actually access these same same services or critical services from your from different environments which which completely shifts the game. So the architectural models need to change. People need to think about um, how they actually think about delivering services um, with security um, in a completely different context. And Robert well, mentioned I see, things that I, yeah. And I would challenge that again, right? I would say they don't need to think about it. That's the wrong framing. What we need to do is trust the experts, right? And that's the problem. The, the problem is structure, a structural problem is that you're not allowed to have an opinion on how the optometry association should do eye testing. The optometry association would do that. But there isn't, because cybersecurity has failed to protect the community, that we haven't um, built enough trust where they just go, okay, the wizards will do it for us and we will trust that they will do it. Right, because the last thing I'm, I rail against security awareness because it doesn't help telling people they're under attack. Right, what helps is an actual solution or a mechanism or something they can specifically do, they can subscribe to, or, or they or they can they can click on. To, um, and the problem fair, with you go on. It's a bit of a. Uh, to be fair, it's a bit of a movable feast uh, in terms of the. Yeah, the well, it's a red. It's a classic red queen gambit, right? So it's the red queen situation. You have to keep running as fast as you can to stay where you are. Okay, uh, and and that's that's what hasn't been recognised, I don't think. I'm going to uh, start drawing this to a close. I wanted to sort of finish up with a comment from both of you, just in terms of the the, the digital economy, the digital economy, and you know progress that's being made towards the integration of all those different systems across the economy that that, that, mm. we, that we need to do. Are we uh, are we optimistic about how this is now progressing? Um, what should government be doing more of in this space and what should they stop doing? I'll start with you, Thomas. What do you, what do you think? Well, short answer for me is I, I am optimistic. Um, I start with, you know, being a citizen who uses uh, government services myself. I think it's, uh, it's, it's great to see that we're actually having um, simplified services right now that I can use from my mobile device. Um, I can do them very quickly. Um, I don't have to bother to go to an office. I think that's that's positive. I, I think you know at state level there's lots of there's lots of initiatives in that space. If you look at public transport and the improvements around public transport, to, you know how you pay for it and things like that. There's lots of stuff that has changed, and I think I'm positive about it. What I would say is that in some in some cases people need to think a little bit harder around, in, in, especially in my industry, around the security elements of that. Because if something happens and we had things happening in, you know, service NSW is a good example where breaches happen and data gets, gets lost. That's where my trust is diminished, right? And then I'm getting a little bit reluctant and say, I'm not going to sign up for that service. Maybe I'm not going to sign up for a digital identity that, that the government or Australia Post is offering me. So I think that's where we have to do a little bit more work and a bit more structure and maybe communication. But overall, I'm, I'm positive. I think it's moving in the right direction. And Robert Deacon, what are you, just to round, round out this conversation? Look, I think if there was one thing to get people to meditate on, it would be that trust doesn't scale. I know only Sith deal in absolutes, but trust doesn't scale. And what I mean by that is the way that humans interact at a sort of a lower so social level doesn't work as you get systems of systems of systems. Um, and therefore, we need things that help us um, develop trust at higher levels. So whether that's, you know, various types of identity, various types of secured systems, various types of certifications, better risk engineering, there's all those additional mechanisms that we need to put on top of normal human way of trusting 
uh, a, you know, a repeated pattern of predictable behaviour. That doesn't work when you're getting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people and adding then billions of devices. Uh, so, you know, think about, think about whether, uh, you know, what do we need to help scale trust in a digital economy? Um, cause it doesn't scale using human, um, normal human sort of psychology. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, look, thank you very much. Robert Deacon, Director of Cybersecurity at the ACCC. Very much uh, appreciate you joining us on this uh, Bridging the Cyber Divide uh, webinar series. And thank you also to Thomas Wickenshire, Regional Director at CyberArk, ANZ. Um, I think it's been a great discussion. I think uh, there's going to be plenty more of them as we move forward with this. Thank you again. Thank you. Excellent. My pleasure.